Hello and welcome to NGen Math 7 by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 1, Lesson 1 on Multiplication. All right, this is the first lesson in the entire course, and yeah, it's on a topic that you've seen quite a bit, but we're gonna be reviewing a lot of important things in this lesson, like how do we multiply decimals together, how do we multiply a whole number by a fraction, how do we multiply two fractions, and also simply, what is the meaning of multiplication? All right, so we're gonna get into all of that in this lesson, and let's start right away with exercise number one. Here we go, exercise one. Samantha is buying five burgers that cost $7.25 per burger. Letter A asks us to write and evaluate a product that finds out how much Samantha pays in total. All right, so never forget that the word product simply means a multiplication problem. So they're asking us to write out a multiplication problem that shows us how much Samantha pays in total. Well, there's five burgers, right? She's paying $7.25 per burger, so we're going to take that $7.25 and we're going to multiply it by 5. Our alternative, of course, would to be add up 5 of those $7.25s, but we don't want to do that. We just want to do the following. $7.25 times 5. So let's review how to multiply a number with a decimal by a whole number. Remember, we're going to just sort of ignore the decimal. We're going to have 5 times 5 is 25. 5 times 2 is 10, plus that 2 that we carried is 12. 5 times 7 is 35, plus another one is 36. Now let me just emphasize something. 3,625 is what we would get if we multiplied 725 by 5. Now the whole point is that because there are two decimal places up here, our answer will have two decimal places as well, which makes a whole lot more sense given the fact that it would then look like this and we've spent $36.25, or better yet, Samantha has $36.25 on these five burgers. Let's take a look at letter B. Many times in an applied problem, one of the parts of the product is a rate. Which part in this product is a rate? All right, now remember, rates are things like miles per hour, or uh, cousins per person, or dollars per burger, right? A rate almost always has the word per in it because we're describing how much of one thing there is per one unit of another thing. We can always see a rate in that per. So the seven dollars, hello seven, and 25 cents per burger is a rate. All right. And again, often, often, often in products or multiplication problems, one of the numbers is a rate, especially if it's an applied problem. Okay, let's move on. Do some more work with multiplication. And let's take a look at an applied problem again that has decimals in it. Exercise number two. Jenna is carrying a bucket that holds 2.5 gallons of water. Water weighs 8.34 pounds per gallon and the bucket itself weighs three quarters of a pound. What is the total combined weight of the water and bucket that Jenna is carrying? Show the work that leads to your answer. All right, so Jenna is carrying two things. She's carrying a bucket, and she's also carrying water that's in the bucket. Now the bucket is three quarters of a pound, we'll deal with that later. The plain fact is, she's carrying two and a half gallons of water, and water weighs, here's our rate, 8.3 pounds per gallon, right? There's that, that rate that we were talking about before. So we need to calculate the weight of water that she's carrying. And we're going to do that using a product. And again, let's go through this together, especially because this is the first lesson and we haven't seen multiplication using decimals for, for you know, at least a summer, right? So let's do it. We've got 8.34, right? That's the weight per gallon times 2.5 gallons. Again, I'm just going to ignore the decimals right now and go through the standard multiplication algorithm. 5 times 4 is 20. 
carry the 2. 5 times 3 is 15, plus that 2 is 17, carry the 1. 5 times 8 is 40, plus 1 is 41. Now I have to put a 0 down because I've moved to the next row of multiplication. 2 times 4 is 8. I think I'm going to erase that 2 just so it doesn't confuse us on that 1. 2 times 3 is 6, and 2 times 8 is 16. We're now going to add those. 0 plus 0 is 0. Then I have 15, carry the 1. I've got 8, 10 carry the 1, and I've got 2. Again, let's talk about then where we put the decimal place on this. Right, the 8.34, make sure that, that that point is a little bit more visible, and that one there. Right? So the 8.34 has two decimal places. The 2.5 has one decimal place. It means our answer in terms of multiplication using decimals should have three decimal places in it. So let's do that. We're just going to go 1, 2, 3. And our final answer is 20.850 pounds. Now, there's really no need for this zero. Right? That's not adding anything to it. Right? You know, it's 20.85 or 25.850 or 25.850000000, you know, et cetera. Right? That's how much we have in terms of water. Now, of course, to find the total weight that she's carrying, we have to take the weight of the water and add to it the fact that we've got three quarters of a pound for the bucket itself. Now, I know that's a fraction, three quarters of a pound, but hopefully in sixth grade math that you learned that three quarters is the same as the decimal 0.75. So we just have to add that 0.75 onto the weight of the water and we'll have the total weight that Jenna is carrying. Let's do that together. Right, we've got 20.85 plus 0.75. Make those decimals a little bit bigger. Add those up. We we'll just add like normal numbers. 5 and 5 is 10. Carry the 1. 8 plus 7 is 15. Plus 1 is 16. Carry the 1. 0, 0, and 1. And that 2. Again, just like before, the 0 here is pretty irrelevant. And there's really no reason to kind of carry it along. We could have it there. But I'm going to actually cross it out just so that we're very, very aware, right, that the total weight is 21.6 pounds. All right, nice applied problem in terms of decimals and both multiplying decimals and a little bit of addition there. All right, let's keep going on and do a little bit more work with multiplication. Multiplication and addition have some amazing properties to them. All right, one of the most important properties of multiplication is what's called the commutative property. The commutative property just basically says that when I have two numbers, the order in which I multiply them is totally irrelevant. 3 times 4 is 12, 4 times 3 is 12. It's actually kind of an amazing fact, and it works regardless of whether the numbers are whole numbers, fractions, decimals, anything else. If I have 1 half times 10, that's the same as 10 times 1 half. And let's look at a problem right now that illustrates the commutative property of multiplication. Exercise number three. Ethan has eight bags that contain three marbles per bag. Look at that rate again. And his friend Amelia has three bags that contain eight marbles per bag. Again, a rate. Who has more marbles, Ethan or Amelia? Explain your choice. All right. What I'd like you to do right now, because this is not the hardest problem, especially for a seventh grader, is pause the video and just try to figure out who's got more marbles. Take a moment. All right, let's do it. So hopefully you came up with the answer that they have the same marbles. As long as none of them have lost any, they have exactly the same marbles. So what does Ethan have? Well, Ethan has eight bags times three marbles per bag gives him 24 marbles. But Amelia has three, three bags with eight marbles per bag, also 24 marbles. So they have the same amount. All right, great. Same amount of marbles. Um, the commutative property is amazingly important in multiplication. We oftentimes use it without even thinking about it. You know, if I have something like 
12 times 5, and that's difficult to think about, you know, what, what are 12 fives, I can switch that around and think of it as 5 times 12. You know, and again, it's a wonderful, wonderful property of multiplication. Addition has it as well, right? 3 plus 4 is 7, 4 plus 3 is 7. It doesn't matter. Let's take a look at another extremely important property of multiplication. The associative property of multiplication. All right, this applies when we're multiplying three or more numbers together. So if I have A times B times C, normally the way I should think about this is, oh, I'll multiply A and B together, and then I'll go on and multiply it by C, right? But the associative property of multiplication says, well, you could do it in that order, or you could first multiply B and C together, and then go back and multiply by A. All right, and let's take a look at exercise number four, which illustrates the associative property of multiplication in sort of four parts. Let's take a look. Exercise number four. Find the product three times two times five in two ways, okay? And in letter A, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find that product by first finding the product of three times two. And in letter B, we're gonna find the product by first finding the product of two times five. So what I'd like you to do right now is pause the video Go ahead and work through A and B, and make sure that they give you the same thing. Show your steps. All right, let's take a look. Let me just move this up to the top of the screen. So in exercise A, right, three times two times five, here we're thinking of it as three times two, which is six, then I multiply by five, and I get a final answer of 30, right? On the other hand, in letter B, I'm first going to do the three, 2 times 5 first and get 10, and then I'll do 3 times 10, and I'll get 30, right? And of course, what we're supposed to notice in this is that the order most certainly did not matter. That is, in fact, the whole point of the associative property of multiplication, is if I'm multiplying 3 times 2 times 5, I can decide on which two of those numbers I want to multiply first. And let's illustrate this in one final part of exercise number four, and that's letter D. Let's take a look. Find the following product by rearranging its factors, those are just parts of a product, using the commutative and associative properties of multiplication. Show how you rearrange it. All right, so <clears throat> what you're going to do, and I want you to do this on your own without a calculator, is I want you to find out what 5 times 4 times 7 times 2 is. Now, keep in mind that we can multiply these four numbers in any order we want, and we should get the same answer. So see if you can find an order that makes multiplying them all four together easy for you. Pause the video and go ahead and try that. All right, let's go through it. Now, for me at least, when I look at this product, I see that five, and I see that two, and I think, Five times two, that's pretty awesome, that's 10, right? And 10 is a beautiful number, especially when it comes to products and quotients. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take this and I'm gonna rearrange it so I do five times two, and then I'll multiply that by four times seven. And again, the associative and commutative properties of multiplication allow me to do this. Five times two then is of course 10, four times seven is 28, and 10 times 28 is 280. Now you may say to yourself, well yeah, but I did that by doing 5 times 4 and getting 20, and then multiplying by 7 and getting 140, and then multiplying by 2 and getting 280, and that's great because it illustrates again the associative and commutative properties, mouthfuls, of multiplication. All right, but what's great is that sometimes we really want to be able to use these two properties to rearrange a product in different ways to make it simpler for us to work with. We'll see that a lot in algebra, but that's later on in the course. Let's keep doing some review on multiplication. All right, now multiplication involving fractions. You know, as we like to say in the math biz, four out of three people hate fractions. You know, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're confusing to people. Um, there's the top, there's the bottom. What do they all mean? Right? And many times we find ourselves in situations where we're multiplying a whole number, like 18, by a fraction, like 2 thirds. All right? And I want you to be able to think about this. What 2 thirds times 18 is, is 2 thirds of 18. Okay? And I want you to be able to think about this in terms of what 1 third of 18 is, and then having two of them. So let's read through exercise number five, and then I'll illustrate how I'd like you to think about this in letter A. 
Find each of the following products of whole numbers with fractions. In each case, your result will be a whole number. Take note of the different ways to show multiplication. And actually, let's talk about that a little bit first, right? Multiplication has many different ways in mathematics of kind of popping up in terms of the way we show it in an, in a, in an expression. So here we use the standard times symbol, the x. Here we use a little dot, and here we've just got a parentheses between the 7 eighths and the 32. All those are legitimate ways of showing a product. Anyway, let's get into letter A, because this is the way I'd like you to think about what 2 thirds times 18 is. Let's take a look. 2 thirds is just 2 times 1 third, right? So when you think about what 2 thirds times 18 is, I want you to be thinking about those kind of properties of multiplication. 1 third times 18 is just 6. So 2 thirds times 18 is 12. Keep in mind, this is the most basic notion of multiplying a whole number by a fraction. One third times 18 is literally one third of 18, or 18 divided by 3. All right? I'd like you to use that same kind of thinking to figure out what 5 sevenths of 63 is and what 7 eighths of 32 is. Go ahead and pause the video now. All right, let's get into them. 5 sevenths of 63, right? That's going to be 5 times 1 seventh times 63. We'll use that dot notation. I'm going to do 1 seventh times 63 first, and that's going to be 9, right? 63 divided by 7, and 5 times 9 is 45. All right, let's take a look at 7 eighths times 32, right? That's going to be 7 times 1 eighth times 32. And I can do this 1 8 times 32 first. 1 8 times 32 is 4, because that's just 32 divided by 8. And 7 times 4 is 28. All right, so this problem actually is seeks to review two things. Of course, the most important thing is, how do we think about multiplying a whole number by a fraction? But also, how do we represent multiplication in terms of symbols? You know, with this x, with this dot, just with parentheses separating the two numbers. All those you're going to see throughout Math 8, or Math 7, sorry, and certainly through Math 8. But the one that's going to start to be shown less and less will be the x for multiplication. Anyway, let's keep going on and take a look at how we multiply two fractions. All right, last skill that we're reviewing today, multiplying two fractions. Multiplying two fractions might be the easiest thing that you do with two fractions, right? Much easier than adding or subtracting or dividing, because when we multiply two fractions together, we simply multiply the tops, the numerators, and we multiply the bottoms, the denominators, right? And so when we have a problem like letter A, right, in exercise six, where it says, find each of the following products, express your answers in simplest form. You may leave improper fractions. We'll talk about that in a moment, right? So when we have something like problem letter A, it's simple, right? We're just going to have 3 times 7 in the numerator, which is 21, and 4 times 6 in the denominator, which is 24, right? That's very, very, very simple. All we're doing is 3 times 7, 21, 4 times 6, 24. If adding fractions was this easy, it'd be awesome, right? But then again, if adding fractions was this easy, 1 half plus 1 half would be 2 fourths, which is 1 half. Anyway, it, it doesn't work that way with adding. The problem here is that 21 20 fourths is not a fraction in simplest form. And it's not in simplest form because there is a common divisor between the numerator and the denominator. We can bo divide both 21 and 24 by 3. And when we do that, we get our simplest form which is 7 eighths. Now, before we move on and have you do letter B and letter C, let's review the idea of cross cancellation. Because sometimes it's easier to sort of simplify as you go. And the way that you do that is when you're looking at this product, you look at the numerator of one fraction, the denominator of the other fraction, and ask, can I divide out anything between those two numbers? And in this case, with 4 and 7, there's nothing that can be divided out. But with 3 and 6, you could divide both of them by 3. So let's do that, right? If we divide 3 by 3, we get 1. Divide 6 by 3, we get 2. And now if I do that product, 1, whoops, 
1 times 7 over 4 times 2, I get that 7 eighths right away. So the, really, the, the quick question is, do you want to do the simplifying up front with cross cancellation, or do you want to wait until the end with canceling like factors in the numerator and the denominator? Most students will find it easier to cross cancel at the beginning because the numbers are smaller. It's easier to think about like what, what's the largest number that goes into both of them, etc. All right, what I'd like you to do is pause the video, do letter B, letter C, get those answers in simplest form, and then we'll wrap it up. All right, let's do it again. Notice here we got the dot notation. Here we've just got the parentheses, you know, showing multiplication. Let's do 12 fifths times 15 eighths. There's a lot of cross cancellation here, so I'm going to do that up front. 5 goes into both of these. 5 goes into 5 one time. It goes into 15 three times. The 8 and the 12 have a common factor of 4. 4 goes into 8 two times and into 12 three times. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to then take those products. 3 times 3 is 9. 1 times 2 is 2. Now there's that improper fraction, right? And it's an improper fraction because its numerator, the top number, is larger than the denominator, the bottom number. Which all that means is that the fraction is larger than 1, which means that we could write it as a whole number plus a fraction that's smaller than 1. That's known as a mixed number. We're going to leave it like this because it says you may leave proper, improper fractions. You can certainly leave proper fractions as well. Let's do letter C, okay? In this case, again, we have some cross cancellation going on. I can divide a 3 into both of these two numbers. 3 goes into 3 once and into 6 twice. Then I can divide a 5 into both of these once and 4 times. Now when I do the product, remember you're doing a product, not a sum. 1 times 1 is 1. 4 times 2 is 8. We get that nice unit fraction, 1 eighth. All right, so simple enough. 7 eighths, 9 halves, 1 eighth. Okay. Let's wrap up this first lesson in Math 7. All right, so our first lesson in NGen Math 7 by eMath Instruction was all about multiplication, you know, reminder of how we multiply using decimals, fractions, important properties of multiplication like the commutative and the associative property, all of these very, very important skills that you'll need going forward. For now, I want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 7 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.